Let us pray. O oh God, our hearts are restless until they rest in you. Fill this hunger with your divine gift of self through your Son, Jesus Christ, in his gift of the Eucharist. He who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory, Glory to, to you, O Lord. Lord. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a large crowd gathered around him, and he stayed close to the sea. One of the synagogue officials named Jairus came forward. Seeing him, he fell at his feet and pleaded earnestly with him, saying, My daughter is at the point of death. Please, come lay your hands on her, that she may get well and live. He went off with him, and a large crowd followed him and pressed upon him. There was a woman afflicted with hemorrhages for twelve years. She had suffered greatly at the hands of many doctors and had spent all that she had. Yet she was not helped, but only grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. She said, If I but touch his clothes, I will be cured. Immediately her flow of blood dried up. She felt in her body that she was healed of her affliction. Jesus, aware at once that power had gone out from him, turned around in the crowd and asked, Who has touched my clothes? But his disciples said to Jesus, You see how the crowd is pressing upon you, and yet you ask, Who touched me? 
and he looked around to see who had done it. The woman, realizing what had happened to her, approached in fear and trembling. She fell down before Jesus and told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has saved you. Go in peace and be cured of your affliction. While he was still speaking, people from the synagogue official's house arrived and said, Your daughter has died. Why trouble the teacher any longer? Disregarding the message that was reported, Jesus said to the synagogue official, Do not be afraid, just have faith. He did not allow anyone to accompany him inside except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they arrived at the house of the synagogue official, he caught sight of a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. So he went in and said to them, Why this commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but asleep. And they ridiculed him. Then he put them all out. He took along the child's father and mother and those who were with him and entered the room where the child was. He took the child by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, I say to you, arise. The girl, a child, a child of 12, arose immediately and walked around. At that, they were utterly astounded. He gave strict orders that no one should know this and said that she should be given something to eat. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord, Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. There's a story from Tolkien's Return of the King, which is the third part of the saga, The Lord of the Rings. And it's a special conversation between two characters. And the first is called Theoden, and the second is Eowyn, his niece. I'm going to read the, the small dialogue, and then I'll go through a description, and then I'll read it again. Theoden says, I have left instruction. The people, are to rule, the people are to follow your rule in my stead. Take up my seat in the golden hall. Long may you defend Edoras if the battle goes ill. Eowyn responds, What other duty would you have me do, my lord? Theoden responds, Duty? No. I would have you smile again, not grieve for those whose time has come. You shall live to see these days renewed. No more despair. Here's the context of that small dialogue. Theoden is the king of Rohan, and he is riding to Gondor to keep it from falling, another human kingdom. And Eowyn is his niece. She is an heir of this kingdom of Rohan after her brother. And Theoden calls her sister-daughter because that's her relationship. She is his sister's daughter. Theoden was supposed to raise Eowyn. And he became overcome by lies. And his masculine and his fatherly potential was robbed for a long time. He was imprisoned by a curse. But now being free of that curse, he is interacting with Eowyn anew. Eowyn is charged with caring for everyone while the adult men ride off. The people have responded to her in that role before, caring, concern, leadership. Theoden's words come to her right before they depart, and she will need to respond. And her uncle's instruction is that she arrive with a smile. A smile that will help grief, a smile that will extend life, a smile that will defeat despair. <coughs> Eowyn is arriving, or supposed to arrive, with her smile. In that moment, and I'll read it again, 
Theoden says, I have left instruction that people are to follow your rule in my stead, take up my seat in the Golden Hall. Long may you defend Edoras if the battle goes ill. What other duty would you have me do, my lord? Duty? No. I would have you smile again. Not grieve for those whose time has come. You shall live to see these days renewed. No more despair. Of course, in this moment, what's happening is, is that we see more than Eowyn being able to give a smile, even though in that moment she's kind of kept from understanding the power that her smile would give if she gave it freely. Eowyn's ability to smile is the ability to manifest beauty. Her smile would bring a revelation into the world of something beyond Eowyn herself. To have her smile is really to have her display, simply, purely, the gift of femininity. A gift that God has made, but that women possess. Eowyn is asked to give a tremendous and powerful gift that can create and change. Beauty can create and change. Her smile, the gift of beauty, will heal. It will uplift all of creation around her. She doesn't understand completely in that moment that if she only smiles, instead of all the other things that she seemingly wants to do that are surrounded in that moment, she does understand that in giving only this one thing, it really will be about letting her identity reveal what's within her. And what's within her will become visible beyond the gesture. The gesture will communicate a reality, and that reality will change the people. It will eliminate despair. It will grant them life. It will keep them assured that new days will come. So in fact, her smile is not really a gesture at all. Her smile is a gateway to some gift of beauty, but it has to come through her. She has to be willing to smile and believe it. It's a fair interpretation, though, that people would say in this moment that Eowyn is not even sure of her beauty. She doesn't even recognize the power of her uncle telling her to smile. And she can't value it fully if she doesn't see it. She's desirous of these other roles. And it's almost as if she's wounded from wanting first to smile before something else. Let me share another story that's similar. One of my favorite, and of course, as you can kind of count on me uh, as a priest, uh, one of the more masculine series that I like is Band of Brothers, which was made about um, Easy Company, a group of paratroopers in World War II. And the series goes through, and it settles into a, an episode called Bastogne. Bastogne is a village in France. And they have this moment where in this moment of the battle, the Germans have grown uh, tired, and it's grown weak and, and far into the war. And they're shelling these American soldiers that are on this line defending Bastogne. It's the last holdout, basically, at that part of World War II. And there's a very unique part of Bastogne, and that is an old church that has become a field hospital that has a, a really skeleton group of, of people running it. And what happens is, is when the troops get shelled, they carry their wounded back to the church, now field hospital, where there is one main character. And her name is Renee. And Renee is the only woman in the entire episode of this series of Band of Brothers in this episode. Eugene Rowe is the medic for Easy Company. And he brings all the wounded back to Bastogne. And in one final moment, of a quiet conversation after many wounded are treated by both Renee and Eugene. They exchange this short dialogue. Eugene says to Renee, you're a good nurse. Renee says, no, 
I never want to treat another wounded man again. I would rather wor work in a butcher shop. Eugene, but your touch calms people. That is a gift from God. Renee, no it's not, it can't be. God would never give such a painful gift. Care, touch that calms people, healing, concern, physical response, a woman who's not afraid of blood, not afraid of the vulgar and the fallen side of humanity. And on a couple of different occasions in this episode, she finds the time to give Eugene a bar of chocolate before he goes back to the front lines. Renee eventually dies, but Eugene is changed forever. His attitude about being on the front line is different from that point on. In fact, he searches through the rubble and finds her headscarf, takes it with him, and carries it. The reality is, is that being the only woman in this episode, when she dies, her loss is significantly felt. In fact, the whole episode begins to feel heavy after her death. And so we have Eowyn, so we have Renee. And realistically, I think that we would agree that these are two pretty powerful women. It is true that Renee has the touch to heal. And it's true that Awen has the ability to smile and bring beauty and calm and can defeat despair. The question is, is that do they realize who they really are? So who is woman? And we can spend a lot of time on that. But let's go to one simple moment in the book of Genesis. Who is woman in the book of Genesis? So let's cut right to the phrase. It is not good for the man to be alone, so I will create a helpmate for him. That's not a great translation, especially in English. And there are numerous writers that will agree with the exact same thing. I'm quoting them. It's not my own thought. It's tough to say that woman is a helpmate. So it actually comes from several, several words that are very hard to translate. And we get the phrase, Azar Konegdo. And so Eve, for Adam, is an Azar Konegdo. So how do we translate this? Christopher West says it this, says it this way. The Azar Konegdo is the strong, saving companion who draws out the best from her partner, from the man. Or as John and Stacey Eldridge have said before, they've written, the various attempts that we have in English to translate Azar Konegdo as helper or companion or notoriously the helpmeet, these translations are incredibly wimpy, boring, flat, and disappointing. The best word to give it, if we have to translate in English, is lifesaver. The woman is the lifesaver. Of the man. Actually, Azar Konegdo is a phrase that reveals God's identity to save. Not just power, but God's power that can save. It's a life-giving and creating love of God that saves. And God notices the man. And God says the man needs this. And God gives man the Azar Konegdo in the gift of Eve or in the gift of femininity. Femininity is the Azar Konegdo for humanity, the strong, saving complement, the lifesaver that draws out the best from every man. So a really quick story. In 2018, I went to Fiyaj Dabai. When I heard about this phrase, and when I saw Eve in a brand new way, I saw the women of my life in a different way. It cracked things open. I began to understand why God had given me particular friends. I began to understand 
why I was being called to get to know various women more in my life as a priest, as a man. And I began to understand just how securing women are by their very presence, not by anything that they do per se, just with their presence when they are around me. Women are the Azar Connecto. This is who woman is in Genesis. She doesn't have to do anything but smile. She just has to arrive, right? Let's go to Mark 5 for a moment. This is a really key gospel when it comes down to healing because both a woman who is elderly and a woman who is young is healed in this moment. And we have on the way to healing this daughter, we have the healing of this other daughter who has been bleeding and for a long time, 12 years. And we go through the moment, and she knows if she just touches Jesus' garment, what she's heard about him is, is that he would bring her life. And it's interesting that she feels the flow of blood dry up. She knows that she's healed physically. But she, in that moment, is confronted by Christ, who is saying, who touched me? And the request of God to, to be with her face to face is there. And she has to overcome this anxiety. And so in fear and trembling, she goes to him. And a beautiful phrase is written by Mark, which says, she tells him the whole truth. It's almost as if when she goes to Christ, she's able in that moment, despite the fear and trembling, to tell him what's happened, to tell him that she's been aching, to tell her that she's been without, to tell her that she's felt incomplete, or that she's felt poverty, or that it's been a tremendous, uh, it's just been a weight in her life to have to deal with this. And she's gone to see so many doctors, and we're assuming that those doctors are probably men. And in that moment, she goes to Christ, and she says, it's a great line, a religious sister shared this with me earlier, she sees something in him that convinces her that she can tell him everything. And in that moment, her healing takes place because she expresses the faith of telling Jesus Christ everything, face to face. There's something about him. She knows that she can share herself with him. Her physical healing is assured, but now she's able to face him and trust him face to face. We don't know what happens to her after that moment. We don't know what happens to the, to the synagogue officials, um, to Jairus' daughter after that moment. But we do know in that moment that God heals two women, one young and one who is older. And God's daughters, both of those women in the moment after that, we assume are now able to tell about Jesus' confrontation of being face to face with and they will bear new life because of what has happened with him. We don't know what it is. It's mysterious. But we trust that both of them will bear new life, even though one is elderly, and even though one hasn't entered into marriage yet. Both of them will bear life. Okay. Authentic, masculine, or authentic femininity. Why do we need healed and authentic femininity? The word mercy in scripture has two words that are used to translate it. The first word is hased. The second word is rechamim. And hased is the more prominent word, and it means to love as God loves. Mercy is to love as God loves. And it has the connotation of being an enduring love. An unfailing love. It can't be beaten. It will always arrive. God's mercy is enduring, steadfast, right? Rechamim is different. Rechamim means unbounded compassion, unfailing compassion. It also is the word in Hebrew for womb. Why is it? that a word of God's unfailing compassion is referenced by the word for a feminine organ. 
specifically the organ that holds life and forms it. Mercy and compassion is God's gift of being made anew, right? It's when God gives us what we haven't had, what we can't make, what we've been poor of not having. And so womb becomes the word that translates God's healing mercy to us, something that envelops us. It literally gives us nutrition. It helps us to be kept safe. It's the interior part of the woman. This reveals the essentialness, too, of the feminine that portrays the healing and the reforming, the compassionate, the pity offering or pity searching love and gift of God. Why do we need an understanding of mercy through the feminine lens of womb? Because it gives us, through the woman, an identity of what she offers and who she's supposed to become. So let's talk about mercy and femininity for the moment in this last part. And I'll offer just a quick quote from John Paul to get us started. It can thus be said that women, by looking to Mary, find in her the secret of living their femininity with dignity and of achieving their own true advancement. In the light of Mary, the church sees in the face of women the reflection of a beauty which mirrors the loftiest sentiments of which the human heart is capable. The self-offering totally of love, the strength that is capable of bearing the greatest sorrows, limitless fidelity, and tireless devotion to work. The ability to combine penetrating intuition with words of support and encouragement. Kind of takes us back to Eowyn. It kind of takes us back to Renee. Maybe they didn't see this. It was before the time of John Paul. Who knows what year it was in Middle Earth when this happened. But they're both called to that kind and level of revelation, even though they might not see it in the moment. So I know that there might be some discerners who are here with us tonight. Let's talk about consecrated life and femininity and the need for mercy through women. Religious life is the assuming, the taking on of giving mercy and of reforming or forming anew. Just for a moment, think about what religious women have done. They've taught They've sheltered the orphan. They've raised them. They've made programs to heal the alcoholic. They bring about newness. They're able to bring about an understanding to the ignorant. They care for, they touch, they welcome, they give a bite of chocolate when you're heading back into whatever it may be, right? They invite you to, your di to their dinner table, right? All of these things that religious women do, and that they've done. It's like what happens at Bethany, right? Where Martha and Mary and Lazarus become that place of dwelling and rest right before Holy Week begins on Palm Sunday and Jesus enters Jerusalem. What does religious life offer? It's not a list of tasks for women. It's a particular smile. In fact, a woman's charism, a consecrated woman's charism, is her particular smile that she offers to the world. Religious women are literally the fonts. They're the places of rechamim, of God's compassionate mercy that reforms us in the world. To say it this way, consecrated women are figuratively like an open womb, a chaste open womb, through which Jesus can welcome and heal the secular, the wounded, the ignorant, the vulgar, anything that's earthly. And then we go back to someone like an Eowyn or a Renee, and we understand that they too were meant to welcome all of this and send people back fresh. So to bear the presence of someone undesirable 
with the graciousness of your smile, to comfort with your presence, to assure and to affirm with your feminine words. It's like allowing Christ to bear life through you, and it's only a life that you can give as women. The feminine is the life-saving force that's been given, right? It saves Adam. The church and Mary, who we see the church through, is the saving force for humanity. It's the feminine that God initiates with and gets her to say, yes, Thea, your will be done. And so tonight, we have time with our Lord. It's face to face. There's intimacy. There's initiation by the Lord into our life. There's a calling and something that God places upon us that all of our discerners, all of those that are here tonight know. And the question is, especially for the women who are here tonight or that are watching, how is God asking you to smile? How does God want you to smile? Remember, for Eowyn, it's more than a smile. How is God calling forth new life from you? How does he want something new from you to be brought forth? Every woman, consecrated, lay, Mary, when they allow God's plans to come alive, they bear through the process of months and through the process of labor, new life, Jesus incarnate into the world. And to be receptive and to ask the smile or the way or the vocation or the next step that I have to take to bear God in this world is a very compassionate and merciful way to ask how we can give God away. So here's a phrase for tonight. Go to him, even with fear and trembling. Tell him the whole truth, whatever it may be, and then offer yourselves, even if others might not know exactly how or what you do, or if it may be mysterious. Go to him. Tell him the whole truth. And offer yourselves. There will be a motherhood, and there will be a gift of your femininity that would not have existed before. The world would be barren without it. We'll finish the quote from John Paul again. A woman is strong because of her awareness of this entrusting, of, of this entrusting. Strong because of the fact that God entrusts her to every human being. Always and in every way. Even the situations of discrimination in which may, she may find herself. So this awareness and this fundamental vocation speak to women of the dignity which they receive from God himself. And this makes them strong. It strengthens their vocation. The perfect woman becomes an irreplaceable support and source of spiritual strength for other people who perceive the great energies of her spirit. These perfect women, Scripture, and in our own, our own day, are owed much by their families and sometimes by whole nations. So go to him, tell him the whole truth, Everything that may be there, every wound, everything in the past that needs healed, everything that you know that him alone can fix. And then allow yourself to go forth to create something new.
of this sacrament of your body and blood. Help us to experience the salvation you won for us and the peace of the kingdom, where you live with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Blessed be God. Blessed, Blessed be his holy name. Blessed be Jesus Christ, true God and true man. Blessed be the name of Jesus. Blessed be his most sacred heart. Blessed be his most precious blood. Blessed be Jesus in the most holy sacrament of the altar. Blessed be the Holy Spirit of the Paraclete. Blessed be the Great Mother of God, Mary Most Holy. Blessed be her holy and immaculate conception. Blessed be her glorious assumption. Blessed be the name of Mary, Virgin and Mother. Blessed be St. Joseph, her most chaste spouse. Blessed be God in his angels and in his saints. May the heart of Jesus and the most blessed sacrament be praised, adored, and loved with grateful affection at every moment in all the tabernacles of the world, even to the end of time. Amen. Amen. 